This is a review of some basic circuitry stuff. I know as mechanical engineers we sometimes struggle with this because we don't use it enough. So let's start out with the very basics. Kirchhoff's laws are very handy. His current law basically says that the sum of the currents at any node is equal to zero. And the voltage law says that the voltage, sum of the voltage drops around a loop are equal to zero. Let's take a look at those voltage first. So here I have a loop starting with this voltage source around here through a resistor around. And basically what we're saying is that the sum of the voltage drops, the or voltage changes, E S plus V R equals zero. And essentially what I'm saying here it is V S equals minus V R. Pretty straightforward. And typically what we'll do for sign conventions, you know, if we say that um, it's saying that the voltage here is decreasing, uh, I can apply that same concept to a more complicated loop like I have here. And actually I can have a, I have a series of loops if, if I'll draw in my VS. I have a loop that goes like this. And the sum of the voltages going around that loop is equal to zero. I have a loop that goes like this. Some of the voltages around that loop go to uh, are all zero. And I have a loop that looks like this. Oops, meant to change colors. Oh well. Uh, some of the voltage drops across that loop are equal to zero. Okay, so I look at the pink loop. I can say that V R plus V C, the voltage drop across this capacitor, it's equals zero. So V R equals minus V C. And if I look at the way I've drawn the currents, I'm going kind of backwards to this resistor here. So again, it's that sign convention thing. Um, what it's really telling me is that, that the voltage drop across this across this resistor is the same as the voltage drop across that capacitor. Okay? And if the voltage drop across the capacitor is the same as the voltage drop across the resistor in this parallel circuit, means basically, you know, the voltages at any given node are the same for all of the for all of the branches. Every branch in that node sees the same voltage. But if we pick one of those nodes, let's, let's start with a simple case. We'll pick a node right here in this circuit, apply Kirchhoff's current law, saying that the sum of the currents equals zero. So if this is I, and we'll call this I R, I plus I R equals zero. So I negative I R. So the current flowing in here, I, is equal to the current flowing out there on R. And that kind of makes sense if you think of a current as is, is the flow of electrons. Uh, whatever electrons and electrons flow in a different direction. But whatever electrons flow into this point are going to have to flow back out back to the source. Now, if we look at a slightly more complicated example, our parallel circuit, we have, I'll label this IS, this will be IC, and this will be IR, IS plus IC plus IR equals zero, or rearranging these things slightly a bit, I come up with the current coming into this node here. I S is equal to the sum of the currents flowing out um, equals minus I C minus I R. So I have the same voltage at each of these points along here, but the current going these different directions is different. 
So the current current going this way is different than the current going that way, and the two of them added together are the current coming in this way. And why is this color not changing? Well, whatever. I guess that's not important. Okay? So that's Kirchhoff's laws, and that's we just apply those whether they're resistors, capacitors, inductors, whatever we have, we can apply those basic rules to calculate the voltage and current in these loops and solve for the voltage across any particular element that we might be interested in. Um, other basic, basic, basic rules, Ohm's law, the voltage equals current times resistance. Um, you will use that everywhere and every when. Capacitors, uh, the, the current through a capacitor is equal to the capacitance C times the rate of change of voltage with respect to time. That's something you want to keep in your head for the exam. And for an inductor or a coil, the voltage is equal to the inductance uh, times the change in current with respect to time. And the, the, the thing to not do is you don't want to get these mixed up. One is I times the C dV by dt, and the other is the voltage is a function of the change in current. So the capacitor, the current is a function of the change in voltage across the capacitor, and for an inductor it's just the opposite. The voltage is a function of the change in current. So what does it tell us? If, if the voltage is constant, of course, our current is zero for a capacitor. If the current is constant in our inductor, we get a voltage drop equal to zero in theory. In practice, there's going to be a little bit because inductors are made out of wires, and the wires have a little voltage drop, but that's neither here nor there. Okay. Let's look at those elements in just slightly more detail. A resistor. This um, is Ohm's law up here. In the upper left, and basically the physics or geometry behind this is that uh, if you have any conductor or good conductor, bad conductor, whatever, the resistance is going to increase as you make this longer. It's going to increase with a smaller area. So if I have a inductor like this and an inductor like, like this with the same smaller cross-sectional area, this is a higher resistance. That's a lower resistance, okay? Um, and we can we can express it in terms of um, sigma here, but that's probably not important for the moment. Uh, one couple things: typically, with most materials, resistance varies with temperature, um, and there's usually some alpha times delta t term. That uh, the alpha can be positive, for mo like most metals, or it can be negative, like many semiconductors. That's something that, depending upon your circuit, may be an issue. It may not. Um, if you're, you know, if you have a very high precision circuit and um, you need high precision resistance, having that change in resistance could be a problem. And then sometimes it can even be a feature to exploit. Um, a therm thermistor is a device to measure temperature because the resistance changes with temperature. If you do something that measures the resistance, you get um, you get a measure of temperature. Uh, the this property here, where the uh, cha the resistance changes with the length of a conductor, decreases the area. If I have if I had a wire that was at a rubber band, like behaved like a rubber band, right? And I stretch it, I'm increasing the length, 
and I'm draw this fat, I'm decreasing the diameter. So as I stretch that wire, the resistance goes up for this reason. And the fact that also I'm putting a strain in that wire tends to increase the resistance as well. And that's the principle behind the strain gauge. You glue the, the wire typically in a grid pattern like this, glue it to surface, and then as you stretch it, the resistance changes and you measure that resistance ch change to measure the amount, to determine the amount of surface of that part you glued it to has stretched or strained. Cap capacitors. Um, capacitor is basically, you have a conductor another conductor. They're connected to the outside world somehow. And I really do want to change colors here, bright green. You have some material in between these conductors here. This material is called a dielectric. It may be uh, a thin film of plastic. It may be a liquid, it may be air. Um, it's anything that, that basically has a good, good insulation. And when we apply a voltage, I'll say I apply V plus here, V minus here, um, I'm going to flow electrons in and they'll build up on this surface and electrons from the other side will flow out. So I'm drawing the arrows in the direction of electron flow, not the conventional current flow, which we typically draw from positive to minus, just to help confuse things here. So as those electrons flow out, they leave behind positive charges. And we build up an electrostatic force between these two plates. Okay. And the electrostatic energy is, oh, let's back up a little bit. As I move those electrons, um, I'm changing the charge in coulombs and um, the amount of charge we get out of it or the number of coulombs or essentially the number of electrons is, is a function of the capacitance and farads times the voltage. That's a measure of, of how much charge we've changed. Okay. Um, and capacitance is the basic variable that we deal with for a uh, capacitor. That's the same C as on the previous page. And the capacitance is a function of the dielectric thickness, the area of those plates, and the uh, permittivity, the dielectric constant of the material in between. So if I make the plates bigger, I get a higher um, capacitance. If I make, since it's inversely proportional to the distance, if I bring those plates closer together, I increase capacitance. If I change the dielectric material inside, I change the capacitance. Um, for a capacitor sitting in circuit, you want those typically to be zero, but if you're using a capacitor as some type of sen oops, sensor, um, well, whatever. If you're using a capacitor as some kind of sensor, then being able to change the area uh, you know, or the area overlap, changing the dielectric, changing the distance are all properties we can use to make a sensor that measures something by changing the capacitance. Inductors. Let's talk about a wire just for a moment. So I have a wire like that, and it's flowing some current. I'm going to create a magnetic field around that wire. Okay. And if I have a coil of wires, 
This is where you find out why I'm an engineer and not an artist, right? These magnetic fields are all going to interact, and this magnetic field will interact with that one, that one, that one, okay? Um, and that causes what we call inductance. Basically, we get inductors by creating a coil with some n number of terms, turns, and if you place that in a magnetic field uh, in Weber's flux linkage results, um, changing this magnetic field changes the voltage in those coils. Just as, just as flowing a current created that, uh, created that voltage, when I change the, change the magnetic field, if I, oops, I'm drawing this backwards. That's okay. Let's put arrows on the end. If I, you know, increase the magnetic field by, let me just redraw that. <laughs> Getting a mess. If I just change the magnetic field across that wire, I'm going to induce a voltage or a current because of that change in magnetic field. So I have this, this thing where we put a current through this coil, we create this magnetic field around these, and we're essentially we're storing energy as, uh, as that, in that magnetic field. And in order to do that, obviously we have a, a you, know, you can't just flow electrons in there and create the magnetic field for nothing. It does create a voltage drop in that uh, formula from the other other slide, voltage equals the inductance times the rate of change of current with respect to time. Um, so the way we can probably remember which is which, you know, inductors and capacitors, you know, if you think of the capacitor as having this essentially open circuit and it only flows current because of electrons passing or leaving when there's a voltage change, it's pretty obvious that um, I is a function of the dV by dt by change in voltage, because if there's no voltage change, you would just build up the charge and the current would come to a crashing halt. Uh, conversely, with a coil, we build this magnetic field as a function, of, with the current builds a magnetic field and um, we have to apply a voltage to get the current to flow or get the current to change against that magnetic field. So we say that the voltage drop cross capac inductor is equal to L D I by D T. And personally, I, I always just think of this when I'm trying to keep straight is, is it, a, is it DV or DI for capacitor? And you think, well, it has to be DV because Without a voltage change, the current can't flow, but that's my way of remembering it. So let's apply these to a relatively straightforward circuit. Here I have just a voltage divider, and we'll assume for the moment that um, that, that there's no current flowing there on this output. So we're just we're just observing the voltage at that point, okay, without disturbing the circuit. So we have a loop. Okay, we have some V in as our source voltage. We have a, a voltage across this resistor and a voltage drop across that resistor. Okay. We know some of the voltages. So I can rewrite that a little bit as Vn equals Vr1 plus Vr2. Okay, that's Kirchhoff's uh, voltage law. I can apply Ohm's law to each of these two uh, voltage drops, and I get Vn equals I times R1 plus I times R2, that's equal to I times R1 plus R2, okay? 
And again, because I know that the from Kirchhoff's current law, the, the current coming in matches the current going out. Current coming in matches the current going out. So I know these two currents are the same and I can uh, rearrange the equation like this. Now I also, what I'm looking for here is the voltage across this second resistor here, right, VR2. And um, from Ohm's law, I can say that, or V out if you prefer, uh, V out, change that. It, you know, V out is the difference between there and ground, equals I, which I know from above, times R2. Now all I have to do is substitute um, substitute in here. Uh, let me just rearrange this just one more time. Equals, all right, not, not equals. Say I solve for I. I equals V in over R1 plus R2. Okay, so now I can substitute this I right into here and I get V out equals R2 divided by R1 plus R2. And that's my basic equation for a voltage divider. You should just kind of know that. Um, oh, times, I'm sorry, this important part here, times V in. Um, you know, base, the, the ratio of the of this resistance to the total resistance, that's the fraction of the input voltage you're going to see at the output there, or at that center in the middle. Uh, common voltage divider gets used a lot, you know, good to know. Um, now I'm making the assumption that the current coming out here is small. If, if, there, if that wasn't true, if there was in fact some resistance here that was not, it was something in a range where it, it mattered to our circuit, then this this equation gets kind of uh, messy, but we won't go there for today. Here's a little more complicated arrangement. But it's, it's again, it's just taking those same concepts and applying them one you know one piece of the circuit at a time. This is a Wheatstone bridge. Um, no, I'll probably spell this wrong. W H E A T S T O N E bridge. I'm pretty sure I spelled bridge correctly. Um, so we have a voltage supply here, uh, plus, and we'll call this zero volts there. This is plus V. Um, so we have. We have a we have a voltage loop that runs like this. We have another voltage loop that runs like this. Okay, and we know that the that the voltage here across here and here is equal to our V ref. Okay, um, and if we look at each branch of this loop, I have, if this is my output of that side, that's, I shouldn't have scribbled over the A, should I? This is my output here. I essentially have a voltage divider between V ref and zero and my VA here. So I can say that VA equals R1 over R1 plus R2 times V ref, okay? That's just the same voltage divider that we did last time. Um, nothing special there, no need to re-derive that. On the other side here at B, V, B equals R3 over R3 plus 
R4 times V ref. Okay, I hope that's pretty straightforward to follow that we can look at that uh, like that. Now we know whatever whatever current I flows through this one plus the current that flows that way, uh, those two currents adding up will be the sum, t you know, total current there, but we don't need this for this solution. And again, like the previous um, example, I'm assuming that the current through this measurement here is, is small. Uh, it gets messy if it's not. But what I want is this measure, this load or this measurement here. This is my output. So my output is V out equals V A minus V B equals R1 over R1 plus R2 minus R3 over R3 plus R4 times V ref. And that's basically the equation for a Wheatstone bridge. We can rewrite that. Um, a lot of times you'll see it as R1, R4 minus R2, R3 all divided by R1 plus R2, R3 plus R4 times V ref. Uh, either one obviously works depending on what you're trying to do with the circuit. Either one you pick. But it's just taking each element, summing things up. So let's look at, these are just resistors and that's pretty straightforward. It's, it's algebra, right? Um, something a little bit different. Let's look at an RC circuit. Here, I've written down some of the equations ahead of time because that way you don't have to read my handwriting. Um, so I have my, my voltage loop, right? And I know the sum of those voltages equals zero. So I can write it here. Uh, my source voltage equals VR plus VC, or um, if I want to rearrange things a little bit, I can say that VR equals the V source minus VC, okay? That's Kirchhoff's law. I know that the current through this loop, I, is going to be the same everywhere. Uh, the current, now I can use Ohm's law on on this resistor. And I can say that um, I equals Vs minus Vc over R, okay? That's uh, applying Ohm's law to the resistor. For the capacitor, um, we can use our formula for capacitors. I equals C dV cross C dV C of the cross capacitor. Um, by dt, okay? And those two are equal to each other, so I end up with essentially this equation right here. And all I need to do at this point is rearrange it. Um, I can solve for Vs, and Vs is equal to Rc times dv by dt times plus Vc. Um, actually, and I've got it rearranged differently before, Probably the better way to arrange this, because if we assume, for example, that our output, uh, our output is the, the voltage across the capacitor, which is a typical way to use this kind of circuit, I can say that um, VC equals V out equals V S minus R times C times D V C by D T. I guess I'm getting kind of angled there. Um, so what does this mean in practical terms? Um, it means that we've created a circuit that has some dynamic behavior. The behavior voltage that we met that comes out. 
uh, of the circuit is going to be a function of the rate of change of across this capacitor. So if if I just put a DC voltage in, just a constant voltage in DS, uh, at some point in time, the voltage across that capacitor is going to go to zero as it charges up fully. My V out is going to be equal to VS. Um, let's draw that. So if this is my, this is volts, this is time. If I just apply a constant voltage at some point in time, my voltage out is going to be essentially equal to that. Okay. What happens? And when I first turn it on, when I first turn it on, obviously the voltage is zero, right? Because there's no charge, and somehow it charges up and approaches this steady state equilibrium position over time. Voltage. As it turns out, without going into the derivation, um, the equation. VC equals VS minus E to the minus 1 over RC times T is what you get when you um, solve that differential equation below. But that's, that's the behavior of that circuit um, in, the, in the 1 over RC can also be written as 1 over tau, where tau is a time constant. Um, I'm kind of getting off track, but what the heck. Uh, no, let's not go there. And the other thing where this circuit might be used, um, you might use it with a uh, oscillating signal coming in. And here we're going to challenge my art abilities again. So if this is my voltage and this is time again, if I have if I have a sine wave coming in, the voltage coming out is going to be also a sine wave, but it's going to be phase shifted and the magnitude is going to change as well. Okay. So the, the magnitude amplitude changes compared to this and then there's this phase shift okay so this the output of that circuit is um, a modified version of the input and the higher the frequency is for this kind of circuit the more the amplitude is reduced and the more phase shift there is so what this circuit works as is a low pass filter um, high frequencies, uh, you know, we said at, at DC, um, we get our output or very low frequencies, our, our v, VC is going to be equal to VS. At very high frequencies, um, the, the output is going to approach zero. And I think that's all I'm going to cover for this. You know, it's just very quick. It's just a matter of applying starting with Kirchhoff's laws, applying the, the, the rules for the different elements in your circuit, um, and sorting out the algebra, and you can, you can solve fairly complicated circuits. Obviously, the more elements you have and the more uh, branches, you know, and interconnects and things that go on, um, you know, the more complicated it's going to get. and you know, messy, but for the exam, we won't see anything that messy. <laughs> uh, expect something at least this messy, but um, and some variation of that. But that's that's the concept. Okay, um, apply Kirchhoff's laws to kind of lay out these these voltages, um, either either the voltages or the nodes. Apply. Ohm's law or the rules for capacitors, inductors, and and just sort out and solve for what you need. It's messy, but it, it's not it's not uh, it shouldn't be a big mystery. And with that, I'll break off.